Thank you. I thank you to MD Expo and the WBA and the Hyatt for putting this on. This is really an incredibly creative uh, way of bringing you guys together in a you know, manageable way, given everything that's going on. So I'm really glad you could make it here. And these things are just an incredible uh, opportunity to not only just get some additional information, maybe, but if you were at the reception last night or just doing some of the networking thing, I can't think of a greater way to recharge our emotional professional batteries and to come into these things of being among like minded souls. And um, even though I've been out of the hospital for 20 some years, I just uh, continue to get the incredible warm fuzzies hanging around you guys. I mean, it's just like I grew up with you from the, the trenches early on, and my first love was biomed, clinical engineering. And, uh, enjoyed the teaching stuff immensely, but the first the first love is digging in the trenches with you guys. So, and at the risk of being uh, some blasphemy here, what we're going to try to do today is by the time we get done, hopefully help you appreciate why uh, we don't have to do leakage current measurements anymore. Again, blasphemy. So before you walk out of here, I'm just hoping you can kind of at least temporarily suspend uh, and, and decouple, if you can, leakage current measurements from safety. Okay? Just temporarily until we get done and see, see where things are at. But you guys historically, and especially in the last decade, you've got so much on your plate, so many things to do. Anything that we can eliminate, get off of your plate, get out of your working day that you don't have to do anymore in a meaningful way, that's a good thing without compromising anybody any, in any, any way, shape, or form. So what we want to try to do by the time we get out of here, and I don't know if you've ever done it, but I can tell you early on and when I first started out doing these things, every now and then I would pop in, what am I doing this for? It's taking a stinking little amount of time, you know, reverse polarity, polarity normal polarity, ungrounded, grounded, all these measurements, and uh, it was always just a, a bit of a pain. But uh, in the last 50 years, these measurements that we've been doing have become somewhat of a sacred cow. I mean, you dare challenge doing this kind of stuff. It's like you're challenging safety, and we're going to see by the time we get done that that's not, not the case at all. Okay? So in order to do that, though, to come up with that appreciation, we have to do some review of some basic AC circuit fundamentals. And this might be, might be painful for some of you from you know, even way, way, way back in your education. You probably had a course or two. And, DC and AC fundamentals, how things work. It's the kind of stuff that you probably rarely use anymore, you know, in a day-to-day -day kind of a way, but it's those fundamentals that provides the foundation to, to support and defend what we're, what we're talking about here. So we'll do a little bit of that. Uh, do a little update on the physiological effects of AC current. How does the body really, really respond to small currents in the microamp range? And um, a little bit of a, uh, also an update on how this whole thing got started, you know, almost 50 years ago. And it's, it's a legacy thing. It's like the QWERTY keyboard, you know, it's not the most efficient layout of a keyboard, but you're not going to change it. It's in stone for all practical purposes. And then uh, lastly, once we put all this together, we'll see why we can legitimately, safely uh, take that, take these measurements off of our plate. Any of you guys uh, uh, with the vendors, manufacturers of safety analyzers? You're probably going to want to shoot me when I'm done here, but uh, I'm not going to help your cause. <laughs> okay. But anyway, it, this all started out. And again, if, you, if you've got some of these fundamentals down, just try to be patient with me if you can. Uh, I hope it won't bore you too much. But all of this got started with Michael Faraday a few hundred years ago when he came up and discovered the relationship between a coil of wire as it moves around a magnetic field. And his basic expression for that, basically we talked about how we can induce a voltage across a coil of wire if it's spinning in a magnetic field. So as long as there's relative movement, that's all that BDT thing means. We could have a stationary coil moving the magnet or a stationary magnetic field move the coil. Bottom line is that simple relationship there will tell us what the induced voltage will be across that coil. Essentially the concept of a generator. Okay. And this is kind of how this thing works. As the coil moves around, we're getting a change. This is what creates the alternating nature of our AC currents and voltages. It changes in polarity as the magnet effectively changes polarity as it spins around the generator. And that's what produces the classic sine wave that we have. And it's the same kind of thing, the period of the sine wave. And all of this ultimately is going to get to the point I'm trying to make. So again, we just got to kind of stick with me if you can a little bit. 
But the period of that waveform, the amount of time it takes to uh, travel in one second is the period of the waveform. And that's determined fundamentally at the power plant by the speed of the turbine. Okay? And, and in our case, in the US, our, uh, our power is at 60 hertz. So that generator is spinning at 3,600 RPMs. Of course, it's very, very, very well precisely regulated to ensure that our frequencies uh, stay at, at, 60, at 60 hertz. <laughs> The reciprocal of the frequency in hertz is the period in, in this case, in milliseconds. So it takes 16 milliseconds for one, one cycle of AC. All of that vector jazz and all of that other stuff, you don't have to worry about that, but it's just that that's the relationship of that period. Okay, you remember some of the labs you may have had like decades ago? And again, I hope some of this doesn't trigger uh, any kind of post-traumatic stress response in you. I have had students, you know, if they had a real shitty experience in a classroom, and then all of a sudden the stuff comes back at them, and it's like, you know, they, they freak out. One of our uh, physiology instructors, she got her PhD in physiology from Med College, and she's a biomedical engineering undergraduate. And when she hears some of these electrical terms, like feminine equivalent circuits, and Kirchhoff's current law, she just starts screaming, because it just brings up all this little bile of pain that she had going through this muck you know back in the day but if you have your your hands in the lab the scopes i don't think we didn't kind of use scopes anymore but we can we can measure these signals very nicely with the oscilloscopes and in this case this waveform would have a uh, peak voltage of 0.2 volts 200 millivolts and a period of 200 microseconds so this waveform one over 200 microseconds is the frequency in hertz so it becomes up about 5k, 5 kilohertz for that, for that signal. Okay. And you may, if you've seen some of this kind of stuff, it drives people nuts. Uh, if you wanted to know, I don't know why, I never wanted to know the instantaneous value of a voltage in a sine wave. But if you did for some reason, this is the expression you would use. Uh, if you know the frequency um, and the amplitude, the peak, you can, you can literally determine the instantaneous value at any point along the sine wave, which we don't need to really need that. But fortunately, uh, what we do use is we, we have a shortcut method for describing alternating signals, AC signals, currents and voltages, and that's what the RMS value of the waveforms are. Uh, root mean square, RMS values, that's what all of our AC multimeters normally read. So when you plug a multimeter into a wall outlet, uh, you're reading AC uh, volts current in RMS values. And the RMS value, sometimes it's also called an effective value because it's the effective value of AC that produces the same heating effect as an equivalent amount of DC. Okay, so if we had a water bath here and we had an AC source, we switched in the AC source, we'll heat the water up to a certain level, the RMS value of that AC source is the same value numerically that we get the same heating effect with an equal amount of DC. So all that uh, effectively means. So coming out of our law, that's everything is we speak of it in terms of RMS. So we're not talking about you know sine omega T's and, and crap like that. We just simply talk about volts in RMS. Okay. So if RMS is effectively a DC equivalent value. So when, our, when, we, when we speak about non-way 120 volts, that's the RMS value of a sinusoidal waveform. If we know the peak value of the waveform, times 0.707, that'll give us the RMS value, and vice versa. If we know the RMS value times the square root of two, you get the peak. So 120 volts RMS comes out to about the peak value about 170 volts or so. Okay. Well, that becomes practically significant if you're designing power supplies or you're replacing diodes or capacitors and power supplies, for example. Those peak values have to be tolerated by the diodes. So the PIV, peak reverse voltage, peak inverse voltage of diodes, you hit that diode has to be able to tolerate those peaks. So you would want a diode you know, well above 170 volts so you wouldn't blow it up. Same thing with working voltages on capacitors. You want to be able to tolerate those, those peak, peak voltages. Okay, so 
completely, the RMS value doesn't tell us anything about the frequency of the signal, right? So it's just telling us about the amplitude because our frequency is fixed. We don't generally care about that because it's, it's fixed. But uh, if you wanted a more complete description of what's coming out of the wall outlet, then this is where we would use the classical definition of what we have. So this tells us the peak value and 377 also tells us the frequency. So 377 is two a pi 3.14 times the frequency 2 pi m so if we divide this by 2 pi we get 60 hertz so again rarely do we ever even need to think about that stuff fortunately everything in rms is all we generally need to worry about okay so it, and this applies to any periodic signal you know whether it be a square wave ramp triangles even uh, emg if you're if you're doing any work or if you have a neural lab where they do EMG measurements, um, we, we apply RMS values to EMG signals, especially when we're trying to operate uh, neurally controlled prosthetics, for example. We can take an EMG rug, EMG rug, bicep, pectoral muscles, and we RMS it, essentially convert it to a DC signal. Now we can use that signal to power, uh, power limbs and things. And that's all where it comes from, just the we, we take, we square the waveform, which effectively gets rid of the negative component. We take the average of it and then take the square root of it to get the units back. And so that's where part of it is. Okay. The other thing we need to uh, appreciate, and again, you guys probably got a, I got a handle on this. This is how things work uh, in a residential, in our, in our homes, and the concepts are exactly the same in our hospital environment. And that electrical power is transmitted at very, very high voltages. In the residential area, uh, it's, it's typically around 14 kV, 14,000 volts. And because it's much more efficient to transfer electrical power over long distances at very, very high voltages. And some of the, the higher the pole gets, the higher are those, those voltages. It could be in a, in a few hundred thousand volts because of the current that we're sending down long miles of wire can not only be maybe in the milliamps, so you get a very small amount of current at those high voltages, so it's much more efficient to get power uh, long distances that way. There was a real big job uh, at the professional piston contest. You may have come across it between Edison, Thomas Edison, and Westinghouse, somewhere in the late 1800s. They were they were fighting over dominance. Who was going to have the power in this country? Who was going to have power in the U.S.? And Edison was a strong DC advocate. He wanted DC because he had a lot of patents for DC motors and everything. And Westinghouse, he had Tesla working for him. And they said, no, no, AC is the way to go because of that efficiency. And some of the political crap they were doing back and forth, uh, the electric chair also just came out in that year, same time. And they used AC in the early electric chairs. And so, of course, the DC people say, oh, you don't want AC in your homes because you're going to get killed with it. And but that, that kind of battle went on. Unfortunately, Westinghouse worked, worked, worked out because it's just so much more efficient. But in order to get that high voltage down to a manageable voltage, we have to go through transforms. We do the same thing in our in our hospitals. This is just a basic example here. And um, fundamentally, it's, it's these Faraday's law in action again. The alternating current produces an alternating magnetic field. You see how it changes from south to north, south to north. That those flux lines cut across the windings in the second area of the coil. So we get an induced voltage in the secondary based on what we're putting in um, the primary cell. Really, really slight how that works. And fundamentally, again, we don't use these relationships anymore, but if the, the basic transformer uh, theory is very straightforward and that just by controlling the number of turns, the windings around what we call the primary side and the secondary side, we can de we can determine whether we're going to step up voltage, step down current, uh, just by how we control the windings on the transform. And of course, the, the flux B here circulates in the core, in the iron core, and it obviously does it back and forth with the changing changing input. One of the reasons transformers always get warm. You know, those little wall warts and things that we plug in, uh, even things you got charging, you know, pumps and stuff. Uh, one of the reasons they get warm is 
because they're not ideal. We put more power into the transformer than we get out. You know, and they can be efficient. They can be maybe in the 90s percent efficiency, but that that loss is manifest as heat. So that's why they get they get warm ones. And if they're really cheap, crappy ones, they get hot, which we don't even want them want them to do. And if you have uh, like in our ORs or maybe some cath labs, where you, if you still have isolated power in those environments, the windings here, the turns are the same. So we put 120 in, we get 120 out. One of the benefits of the transformer is that the output now is now isolated, electrically isolated from earth ground, which is not on the primary side. So it's coming back to you painfully. Key, key thing going into this though, Another crucial uh, concept, again, this is residential example, but uh, applies to our environments as well. In this case, in the residential, where we have 220, uh, 240 coming into the house, and we have a center cap on the transformer. So we can we have 220, 240 available to operate, you know, air conditioners, ovens, baseboard heating, and that kind of thing. But then we can split uh, between one phase and the center cap to run 120 lighting, uh, that kind of thing. The key thing though is where these conductors come into the building, come into the power panel, breaker panel, is the neutral is bonded to the physical earth. And this only should be happening at the entrance panel where the, where the, where the power comes in to the building. So what this effectively translates to is that the hot side of the line is referenced to the physical dirt. I mean, in the New York, they can refer to it as an earth ground Ground, it is literally reference to the physical earth. So, you know, if you're standing naked in a mud puddle in the dirt, you know, you stick your finger in that little blade, the hot side of the line, you're going to get bit because it's reference to the physical earth. And that, that's also crucial by code. We have these colors, the size of the small blade on the parallel blade outlets is the hot, larger one is the neutral, of course. The ground. So the key takeaway again here is only when the power comes in, ground and neutral are bonded together. I don't know if you've ever done this, but I remember back in the days um, where we get intermittent, you know, behavior going on, and you couldn't figure out sometimes what was going on. A uh, thing I found out later on is just if, if you ever tried measuring the neutral ground voltage, you can make up a real simple pigtail and a you know a plug. And just uh, you know, bring the neutral and the ground out of the plug, and with banana plugs on the end, plug it into your multimeter. So if you're suspecting you, you're having intermittent funky problems that you can't quite nail down, try going over to the outlet that the device is plugged in and measure that neutral ground voltage. Uh, uh, ideally, that should be zero because if this bond is intact, you've basically got a short, a short between the neutral and the ground. If you start measuring voltages in one and a half, two volts or more, that should be a warning sign. You've got something whack somewhere in your environment somewhere. And this is not uncommon after you've renovated areas, you got 50 different contractors coming in, who knows what's going on. And if something doesn't get tightened properly, doesn't get done right, you can end up with potential voltages here uh, between the neutral and the ground. That can create some real funky behavior in a lot of our power supplies and a lot of our, our circuits. Or just a little thing that might give you some uh, okay. This all led to the development of the grounded receptacle. And I only found this out maybe five years ago, an MSOE student here in Milwaukee invented that outlet. A student in 28, 1928, Philip Labrie or something, came up with the design, the concept for adding a ground to the outlet. And uh, the, 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 the the story was that he, he lived in some apartment around here and his landlord's cat was getting shocked every time it backed into a fan, metal box fan or something. So he came and had this flash of putting the ground in there and um, took off ever since. Okay, here's where things start to, we need to maybe think about a little bit more. Again, for the last 50 years, especially our HTML and biomed community, We've, we've been focusing on, in addition to measuring the leakage current, we also measure the ohmic resistance between 
between the pin and the case of the equipment. And you know, we've had codes about this. Uh, at one point it was like 150 milli ohms, 0.15 ohms, about 0.5 now. But that, that's a legitimate thing that we want to keep doing. So when I'm talking about getting rid of leakage currents, eventually, we're not talking about getting rid of doing this test. We're verifying the continuity of that pin to any conductive point on the case is still a legitimate, meaningful thing to do. We'll see why that is in a bit. What I was always bothered by, however, we put all this energy and effort. I don't think, I don't hope nobody's doing it anymore, but in the early days, we were actually documenting the crap, writing it down. How many W ohms, how many ohms was the resistance? You know, a ton of time going in there. Uh, but what we never really can follow it along, uh, we could have a perfectly intact brown wire, but if the if the ohmic resistance between the pin and the receptacle is bad, which it can be if the if the retraction forces start to get lower than eight to four ounces or so, you know, if you got a sloppy outlet, the resistance here could be quite high. And similarly, which I don't know if any of us ever do, we always kind of gave it up to facilities to do, be responsible for this. If the ohmic resistance between the receptacle ground and the physical earth is also not kept low, then this falls a moot point. The only way the ground works, obviously, and effectively, is if it is intact all the way back to the physical dirt. Okay? So any you might have a great, again, great power cord, line cord, uh, great uh, continuity there, but if it's compromised anywhere along the way, it's, it's like you don't have it connected at all. And this is where we're really talking. So this stuff is typically buried in the dirt outside our homes. We typically will have two, maybe eight foot rods buried in the physical dirt, bonded together, and that conductor comes into the power panel, making that connection. Heard stories about if some rural hospitals, if you've got a varying water table, you know, some very varying water table in an area, that ohmic resistance could become quite different. You know, it may become very high as well. And there's special equipment out there for testing that kind of stuff, which maybe your places do, but I never move anybody that did it. They might tell somebody they do it, but so you don't want to do that. Not that we do that, but your dads may have done that today. We don't need that damn thing, you know, because you, you, you didn't have an adapter or something. What are you going to do? A couple other concepts uh, before we get into some of this other reality, but these are the two dudes that came up with some fundamental uh, basic laws, Ohm and Kirchhoff. And uh, what's so amazing about this, again, a couple hundred years ago, these incredibly delicate, simple, stinking relationships are profound in what they describe and, and what they reveal in the behavior of currents and voltages and resistance in these, in these circuits. V equals I times R, uh, basic, basic relationship. Another neat thing about these things, I always mention to the students, unlike you know, programming, software engineering, where you got C, Java, you got every every few years, this, this code the language mutates, changes. This stuff doesn't go anywhere. So the, the benefit and the beauty of this, it's in stone. You know, so once we learn these things, it's almost become part of your DNA, not going anywhere. Okay. But what we're primarily interested in, uh, in regards to leakage currents, things from the law of it, is how do these currents and voltages behave in an AC environment? And in that regard, this is where we now refer to resistance as impedance. It's essentially uh, opposition to current flow, but everything we plug into the wall can, can look like and, and looks like electrically either just a simple resistor, we'll see, like I get incandescent light bulb, coffee pot, heater, or it looks like a resistor in series with a capacitor, or it looks like a resistor in a series with a coil or wire, solenoid valve, motor, electrically can be reduced simple series of components. And this becomes significant, we'll see, uh, in a bit. Okay. So you can also think of impedance as basically a frequency-dependent resistance. So the resistance, impedance of a coil, of a capacitor, changes with frequency. And 
and virtually all of our things that we plug into the wall have a combination of the components in it. They look primarily capacitive, primarily inductive. That's going to affect uh, the impedance. So things that are purely resistive, again, think of this light bulbs, coffee pots, heaters, uh, they look and behave just like Ohm's law in a DC environment. I is equal to V over Z. Okay. Power also, power over voltage. But this, the, the point here is that the current and voltage are in phase with each other. So at any point along the waveform here, I equals V over Z. So current voltage move in phase. Again, we don't normally worry about some of that stuff. Uh, if you are around the facilities, people may worry about it um, because if you end up in an environment where a lot of hospitals and big organizations do, they got a lot of air handlers, a lot of conductive motors and motors and things going on. If we start to get uh, too much out of phase, the power uh, companies, they can penalize us uh, because it, it costs more money to transmit power that is not in phase. So they can penalize you so your electric bills can be higher if you're not kind of diligent as to what you're uh, plugging into your environment. So this is what motors, speakers, solenoid valves kind of look like where we now have an inductance element in there, L, in series with the resistance. And now the current and the voltage is out of phase with each other. And in this case, the current is lagging the voltage. So if this is a voltage here, and our current here, you can see when the voltage is at a peak, the current is just getting started. So it's why we say the current lags the voltage in an AC circuit. Again, reality, practical stuff, we generally don't care about that. Again, if you're a facilities manager and you got a ton of you know, inductive loads on your facilities um, to power, you can get penalized for that at phase shift. It's going to get it more costly. Where we do get concerned about, and this is a key to the leakage current issue is just appreciating what a, what a capacitor is and what capacitance is and it's a it's a passive device capacitor it's passive devices but they are effectively all they consist of is essentially two conductors separated by an insulator we call it insulator, a dielectric there's two conductors separated by an insulator so we can make a physical capacitor that way uh, even a piece of line cord zip cord has capacitance associated with two conductors separated by an insulator, there's capacitance. And that capacitance is um, a, it, it becomes a conductor. In fact, that's what they will see. Currents can flow through, alternating currents can flow through capacitance. Capacitors. They block DC. So if we were in a DC mode, uh, the, the capacitor looks like a big insulator, the DC. But under AC conditions, current can pass through capacitors. And the impedance of the capacitor, we sometimes uh, re refer to it as a capacitive reactance. It's in ohms. Uh, and so it behaves like a frequency dependent resistor. So as the frequency goes up, the capacitive reactance goes down. So at really, really high frequencies, the capacitor looks increasingly like a short circuit. I don't know if you guys have a, maybe some of your clinics, the dermatology clinics, dental clinics, the hypercators, have you seen those? They're like little smaller electrosurgical units, and they uh, typically have only one lead on them. You guys see them that way? As opposed to an electrosurgical unit that has a, you know, a return electrode, a ground electrode, the hypercator, especially some of the older ones, there was just one wire. And the patient sitting in a dental chair, uh, the, the physician could do essentially small electrosurgical procedures with only one lead. Why that worked is because of the patient's body, the capacitance between the patient's body and the chair. They're effectively capacitively coupled to a ground, to a return path. So uh, at very high frequencies, you know, you get in the hundreds of megahertz, that reactance here becomes relatively very, very low, weak, low, low ohmic value. <laughs> But this is the primary source of where our leakage current comes from, from a phenomenon we call stray capacitance. We may not have a physical capacitor, 
in some cases we do, but we may not have a, a physical compassion between the hot side of the line and the case. Just the sheer proximity of a conductor, black wire, to a metal case, there's capacitance. And again, at 60 hertz, this has a finite amount of impedance or residual ohms to it. And that finite resistance is going to allow a current flow from the hot side of the line to the case. And then back to ground if it's intact. Even a line cord, an unterminated line cord. Next time you get home back to your shops, try just get an unterminated line cord and plug it into your analyzer and see what the leakage current is. You might measure somewhere you know, 10 microamps. Even though there's nothing connected to the cord, you might get leakage currents in that in that region because of the sheer proximity of the hot to the neutral, the hot to the ground conductors are conducting a current flow through those stray capacitors. Okay, it's almost it's unavoidable, it's un typically unwanted, but it's a byproduct of simply building stuff. I don't know if you remember, some of the older guys might remember. Uh, Dale, I think electric used to make these great big honking line cords. They were blue. You guys, any of you guys remember seeing any of that stuff around? They were, uh, mm -hmm. they were, God, they were they by, by half, five eighths of an inch in diameter. It's really big ass line cords. And uh, why they were big is they had polypropylene insulators in the conductors. And this is back probably in the 70s when we were, when we were just crazy, paranoid, and ignorant about all of this leakage current stuff. We had line cord that had very low leakage current associated with it. And how they got that low leakage, leakage, they put these polypropylene insulators separating the conductors because the capacitance is inversely proportional to the distance. So the farther away the conductors are, the less capacitance you have. They were trying to work with that crap. It's a real job. Okay, so the um, impedance typically capacitive and resistance and just the opposite happens in RC circuits the, the current now leads the voltage uh, in this case and this will be significant in a bit here when you see it. One of the other things you may frequently encounter you probably if you, you, you're doing a leakage current test and you get something very very high you know in the hundreds of microamps maybe even over 500 and uh, more often than not that's because the device has a line input filter and you know, built into the into the, into the device. These things can be incorporated right into the line cord socket where the plug enters. And these devices have physical capacitors built in them from the hot side of the line to ground, the neutral to ground. So we have a deliberate, intentional physical capacitor in these devices. And they're there because they're, they filter noise. They filter noise coming into the device remember at really really high frequencies capacitors look increasingly like a short circuit so if you've got a bunch of high frequency crap coming in to your device these capacitors are going to shunt that crap to earth to ground protecting the device then similarly it also protects the, the power line from getting contaminated from your instrument if your instrument generates a lot of rf um, that same rf high frequencies crap can get shunted to the ground. The downside is of those devices it will jack up the ungrounded leakage current quite hot. Yeah. I'm getting there. Little by little, I'm getting there. Okay. So for example, if we just had 10 nanofarads, 10 nanofarads, 10 to the minus ninth farads of straight capacitance between the hot side and the case, what the what the basic theory tells us is that the resistance of that stray capacitance is about 265 kilo ohms. 265 kilo ohms in the 120 volts RMS, the leakage current that we would measure is around 450 microamps just from that stray capacitance. Not even a physical capacitor there, again, just the proximity of the of the conductors. This is why in the old days, too, if we you know if we saw something like that, we get all nuts and crazy and we put an isolation transformer. You know, adding a whole other piece of equipment at a cost, weight, uh, to bring that leakage current. I'm kind of ashamed to even tell you this. After I got out of MSUE, uh, I was working for a while at Elmbrook Hospital here in Milwaukee. Don't tell anybody this, but I, had, I actually had a bachelor's degree and I didn't understand half the stuff. 
and I was just working primarily as a, a tech in there. And I went to their stress lab and they had a treadmill in there that had just some very high leakage curve. You know, this was like in the mid 70s and I'm completely paranoid to hell about killing everybody. I went into my dino comes like a phone call. Wait, who's it? Of course, they didn't ask anybody, they didn't tell anybody. Of course, they got patients lined up for stress tests. Here's a little dumb monkey kid comes here and cuts a plug off of my treadmill. Well, he has to say, you dumb bastard, what the hell are you doing? You know, but um, I'm just, I didn't understand enough about what was going on. And I was just on this mission from God to save lives. You know, so I wasn't going to, you know, I'm going to get out of But um, anyway, that's where, where, where some of this stuff comes from. And if you just when you open this stuff up again, physical proximity, you don't have to have a direct short, you don't have to have a defective cable, you know, insulation breaking down, just the sheer proximity of a conductor, the hot to the case will do that. I don't know if any of what you can also have uh, physical conductors. Um, I, I distinctly remember in the lab at some of the big centrifuges that if the brushes worn out, you'd get a thin graphite dust that would line the inside of the centrifuge that could actually see leakage currents going up because of that. The dust from the graphite, but uh, just from the sheer parasitic capacitance, you could get uh, conductor. Okay, getting down to the nitty here, we took an actual valley lab, and if we look at the voltage going in, 120 volts RMS, about 170 peak, and we also measure the leakage current, the current flowing in the ground. Again, through a standard Amy 1K ohm load, this is what you'd see. So you've got a little phase shift going on here. The, the current is leading the voltage, which tells us we have the equivalent RC circuit there. We can actually further analyze that. We can find out how much of the phase shift we actually have. And in this case, we can convert the time from the horizontal time base to an angle about 84 degrees of phase shift. And once you know that, you can come down and you can determine what the leakage impedance is that's causing this 81 microamps RMS of leakage current that's being measured. So how we get 81 microamps is equivalent to having a 155K ohm resistor in series with a 1.8 nanofarad capacitor. So that is electrically the equivalent to what that valley lab looks like for your safety analyzer. That's what we're measuring, the effective leakage, if you will, from the hot to ground through that 1K ohm system. That's what it looks like. And every device you plug into an analyzer could be, you could look at it the same way. Magnitudes would be higher, smaller, um, but what you're effectively measuring is that is the amount of that parasitic strain capacitance in play in your device. Kind of making sense a little bit. Again, this is not the crap you'd kind of do in the real world. I mean, it's, 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 it's this fundamental stuff that ultimately can be used to challenge the regulators, the joint commissions, and everybody that comes in there and tells you how to do all of this stuff. And I can't tell you, uh, literally, in every hospital, I was in three major hospital systems over 22 years, in every single hospital, I almost got fired for fighting this people. You know, and uh, I got the very first time at uh, Lakeland, when I started out, I went out of MSOE at Lakeland Hospital. They were doing conductive floor tests in the OR. I don't know if you remember that, some of you guys, the OR guys. It used to be in the 1970s, every month, you had to go in the OR with a special ohmmeter and measure the resistance of your floor. I pound weights like three feet apart, and, and, and go around the OR, measuring the stinking resistance of the floor. This was back when they weren't even using flammable anesthetics anymore, but that requirement stayed in the code. And our electricians and facilities, they were doing it diligently for years. They had binders full. Of resistance measurements in the, in the conductive force. And I was just setting up a program up there, and I said, Well, I'm going to be in the area anyway, so I'll, I'll take that over. And they go, You dumb little bastard, go ahead, have at it. You know, so I got in there, I started to realize, geez, we got electrosurgical units, you got the 
phobias in there, you got all kinds of stuff. I, so that's where I put my emphasis. And after a few months of doing that, I thought, what the hell stupid ass thing is this? So I just quit doing it. I got tired of shit. I just quit doing it. And um, I was there maybe a year or so. Joint Commission came in. The surveyor came down with the administrator to raise the very first question that the surveyor asked. So let's see you're conducting the floor records. <laughs> well, we used to do them, but we don't anymore. Administrator called me up, ripped me a whole new orifice, a couple of, who the hell do you think you are? Dumbass ass. We was, you know, of course. But fortunately, we got rid of those things. But man, you didn't pay a price. <laughs> Some of you may have already done too. But anyway, so this is what uh, currently we have in place. This is an Amy Ancy standard, been around forever. And it took the community, I bet it took eight, 10 years before we had a standard because there was so much misinformation and ignorance around all this. But ultimately, there's a standard test load on how we measure these leakage currents, where we measure the voltage across a 1K ohm load with an RMS Billy volt meter. Uh, so it reads current directly in micro amps. Okay, so once we get some of that done, the next thing we just touched on a little bit is what, how does electricity physiologically affect the body? How are we going to do any harm to a patient or the user from electricity? And fundamentally, the bottom line is you have to be part of the circuit. The user, the patient has to be electrically part of the circuit in order to have any current flow pent through you period. There also has to be a difference in potential, a voltage difference across the patient, the person, the staff, or the, or the patient. And I don't know if you also remember, there was another incredibly dumbass code requirement in the 70s somewhere that required every conductive surface within the city of the patient be connected to an equal potential grounding bus. Maybe some of your hospitals that had walls, you maybe you've ever seen those where you, you've got a panel with a whole bunch of big green jacks in there. Used to be required that you had to have a number 10 green wire, everything conducted in the vicinity of the patient had to be conducted, uh, conduct, connected to that panel. The theory was, again, egghead theory, it's true in theory, is that you can't have a shock if there's no potential differences. So if we just ground the snap out of everything, there won't be any voltage differences to shock anybody. Of course, you're going to break everybody's neck by tripping over all these damn cores now that we have. Unfortunately, that ultimately went away. But bottom line, it's the currents that do the damage. Bottom line, if you ever got a you know, static shock, you could have tens of thousands of volts. You'll get startled, but you won't die from it. But uh, bottom line, uh, the physiological effects are going to stimulate excitable tissue, which can cause contractions uh, like tasers do, uh, or you can get burning, like with our heating, heating damage if the currents are, are large enough. And this is a classic diagram showing the physiological effects. These are not quite as accurate, um, especially down here. The threshold of perception, I'll show you, is much, much lower than a milliamp. But um, the key, even the electrical current, we know is much lower. The electrical, electrical threshold is right around seven to nine milliamps, uh, which is why our ground fault circuit interrupters trip at about five. And that's a legitimate threshold, electrical threshold, that if you get above that, you get seven to nine milliamps, AC 60 hertz current passing through you arm to arm, you will not be able to let go of the conductor. The muscle code contractions will be so intense, you physically cannot let go. And that's in that, in that range there. I did a taser case a number of years ago. Unfortunately, here in Milwaukee, a young guy got tased and he died. And we don't know why that happens to this day. Many people, they get tased all the time. They don't die. Some people die. And in this particular case, this uh, kid was tased like I think 12 times. I had it on a download kit. The taser stores everything. Every time it's discharged, it stores the time, date, and even the outcome temperature every time the trigger is pulled. And uh, those taser, very, very short duration pulses, but they're in the uh, four to eight amps range. Very high magnitude, short, very, very short duration uh, pulses. But what often happens, and you see this consistently with the cops when they tase somebody, that when you get tased, it hurts like a bitch. I mean, you go into almost a massive technique. 
your, your body, your whole muscle just, they just clamp up and you can't do anything. But invariably, you'll see the cops yelling, hands behind your back, hands behind your back. Well, you cannot do it. You physiologically cannot put your hands behind your back when you're in a state of near tetany. So they often interpret that as non-compliance. They, they keep zapping. You know, but um, so the same kind of concept is going on here with muscular sort of at the, at the medical threshold. And this is a, a device I made a number of years ago because trying to tell treat, teach students about microamperes, they're looking at you like, okay, how far is Pluto? You know, it's such an obscenely abstract small number that I thought, well, if you feel it, maybe you'll understand. It. So I made this simulator uh, device here where you put your two fingers on it and you turn the knob until you just perceive the tingle. Of course, they look at you, how do you do that? Well, eventually I just make them do it. So they appreciate it. But the whole concept of threshold of perception is crucial to where we're going also. The only reason, like in this case right here, for example, 176 microamps, um, you can't, you're not feeling it yet. And why we're not feeling it, even though the current is physically flowing through our fingers is because it's below threshold of perception. If you remember some of your, your neurons from your physiology, if you had that somewhere, there's a, a threshold at which nerves fire, nerve impulses are generated, and they only do so once their voltage across their cell membrane exceeds a threshold. Normally the cells look like a little miniature battery, just like when it's at rest about minus 70 millivolts. Physically, you can measure across this nerve cell. And when that membrane potential gets up to about minus 55, the cell kind of goes berserk and generates an impulse, a nerve impulse or action potential. The brain ultimately interprets that. That's how the brain gets information, whether it be sight, sound, touch, pressure, whatever. It, it interprets that as a stimuli. So when the, in this case, the electricity, the, the stimuli is less than that threshold, you don't even feel it. It is below threshold of perception. And this is going to be a component of where we're ultimately uh, going. In fact, I brought this machine to the uh, uh, the Illinois meeting last year, I think. I had it on this place and made a poster so you could come up to the thing and, and zap yourself and find out what your threshold of perception is. Okay? So this is essentially what the brain is doing. Uh, it, it, it encodes intensity with frequency. So when you stimulate, possibly you stick a knife in your head, you know, step on a tack, uh, whatever it is, the, those neurons, those receptors, generate these action potentials, these pulses. These travel to the brain, and the brain then interprets the intensity by the frequency. You can actually, your, your neural guys do this kind of stuff when you're doing EMG work as well. You can, you can actually turn the speaker on to the EMG, and you can hear it pop, 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 pop. They tell you to move your arm, move your leg, and it doesn't sound like the motor going on because the muscles are not and nerves are firing. So this is the little device, and I used to use this on the students all the time. And uh, over a number of years, and I get consistently the same kind of result, results. The women typically have lower thresholds of perception. So this is the average. In this case, about 241 microamps. And these error bars are plus or minus two standard deviations. So this simply tells us about 95% of the samples here, the leakage, the thresholds vary from maybe 220 to 260 microns. Guys are always a little higher, about 258, and consistently, consistently, there's a much wider error bar here. I don't know why that is for sure, but I, 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 I bet money on it, because invariably you get the guys doing it. I don't feel like it. Watch it, tell you. Oh shit, yeah, you do. You know, just follow the rules. <laughs> the girls always follow the rules. Okay, I feel it here. So we get a lot more or less variability there. The guy is running, eh, yeah. So they screw up the experiment. So, but anyway, bottom line, you, you, see, you typically see that. But this is ultimately significant to where, where I'm headed here in a little bit. Okay, so that's just threshold of perception. So that's why our some of our leakage current limits are where they're at, is to try to avoid some of that. Again, this is not lethal, this is not going to hurt anybody, but you can have a smarter reaction. You know, if you got exposed to that, you might jerk, fall off a ladder or something. Okay, this is the article that um, almost literally, uh, in many respects, gave birth to our whole profession. 
uh, whether you kind of know this back in the early 70s, 1971, Ralph Nader of all people in the Ladies Home Journal came out with this article claiming that we were electrocuting about 1,200 people a year at our nation's hospitals. The Joint Commission took off on this, the FDA took off on this, and many hospitals created departments, our HGM biomed departments, and had people come in and do all this safety stuff. The very job I started with that Lakeman was this cost just for that reason. The Joint Commission started mandating it, and uh, it kind of went berserk. And there he's often credited as starting the whole safety movement, the whole safety scare, but actually it wasn't him. It was a surgeon, a physician, Carl Walter, a few years before, I think it was right around 1968, uh, he's the one that came up with the 1200 number. And he was out there at medical conferences spouting that off. He was also chairman of a uh, NFPA committee on hospitals. The guy was an MD. So he had, he had some influence on the NFPA level. He was also credited with starting blood banks, like in the 40s, he invented the blood bag. And supposedly he also did some stuff with castle sterilizer in there somewhere, he came up with the concept of autoclave, steam sterilizer. So the dude had some credentials. You know, so when he talked, people were listening to this guy. But he started it out in, the, in around 1968 at these meetings, claiming that we're killing everybody out there in the nation's hospitals. They had no basis for it, no basis at all. In fact, the number came from some actuarial friend of his. Well, in 1964-65, we, we had some incidents, and they just extrapolated. It was just real mushy, mushy science and things like that. But he took it, and he ran with it. The only one out there fighting, Joel Noble, Dr. Noble, if you remember, he used to be the president of ECRI. And especially in the day, that was the only credible resource we had when it came to devices to see these people knew what they were talking about. And he came out and just was arguing against this guy, you know, saying, hey, we, we, we're doing a lot of stupid stuff here based on nothing. And so he was really trying to get people to think the other way. But that's where that got uh, started. And uh, Malcolm Ridgeway's got a really great, uh, incredibly detailed article about this whole thing in uh, uh, one of the clinical engineering handbooks, the first, first edition. But this is the worst case scenario that started the entire movement, the entire thing. All of our safety testing, everything that's going on out there emanated from this worst case scenario. So what we've, what we've got here is an electric bed with a bad ground. And you remember some of the older electric beds, virtually all of them had metal guardrails on them. Uh, conductive, very conductive, we had bad ground. We had a patient in this bed with an indwelling cardiac catheter right into the heart muscle, exteriorized to an external pacemaker, okay, laying in this electrically uh, ungrounded bed. Okay. The attendant, unwittingly nurse, whatever, leaning on the guardrail and touching the catheter. Okay. The leakage current from the bed now, we follow this little dashed line around, is conductive through the bed frame, through the nurse, below their threshold of perception. Nurse doesn't even feel a thing, a couple hundred microamps, going right through the nurse, through this catheter, now directly into the heart muscle, right into myocardium. Back in the old days, we near grounded the right leg. You know, we didn't have the isolation in our systems like we do now. So the right leg was near close to ground potential. So that leakage current right through the nurse, didn't even feel it, but low threshold of perception through the heart, back to ground, boom, just fibrillated the patient, died. Kill him anyway. That's the scenario that was out there at the time. And, uh, and that's how they thought it happened. And um, so it was like hard to argue with that. We, we didn't know really what the threshold of fibrillation for humans because you couldn't do experiments on a human being to find out when you kill them you know that was not ethical but we had a lot of data from dogs dog experiments and we found out that you know really low currents 50 10 microamps could fibrillate dog heart so back in the early days the leakage current threshold was set really really low because of all of the data we just had on dogs you know dog health dog health. 100 microamps of fibrillate dog heart, we don't want to fibrillate a human. So that's where these early leakage current things came from. But you can just see some of the language. Um, however, two to 300 microamps is much too high, and that levels of 50 to 60 microamps can produce significant number of fatalities. 
So there was a language in the scientific literature at the time that kind of just fed the movement, you know, fed the paranoia, fed the fed the industry. And um, you know, I remember that stuff, and it's like I cut the plug off the cord. And uh, but that's all the information we had at the time that, that contributed to all this. Okay. So here's where this is all coming down now, right? Last few minutes. Why we don't have to do leakage current measurements anymore. There's actually five events that all have to be present before we're going to shock anybody. Five independent events that have to be present. First of all, we need to have a conductive surface on our devices that's capable of being energized from the inside. So we're not talking about ornamental main tags or metal tags. Conductive surface that is capable of being energized from the inside, first thing. And what we have to think about now, so much of our devices, where is the conductive surface? Many devices we just don't have, you got polymers, plastics, uh, you don't have conductive surfaces on them. The only thing you might have conductive if the manufacturer gave you a nice grounding plug so you can do your leakage correction. Your, your own your ground cord resistance, right? The plastic cases, um, partly, partly one of the things. The other thing we have to have, remember the RC circuits? We have to have sufficient coupling between the hot side of the line and the case for this to happen. Next thing. So if you, if you don't have that, you don't have an issue. The other thing we have to have is sufficient coupling. Okay. We need to have a defective ground. So the ground wire has to be bad. Uh, either at the machine, at the outlet, or physical earth. That's, that's the third thing that has to be present if we're going to shock somebody. Okay. And that's why ensuring line cord resistance is still a good, important thing to do, but we shouldn't forget the rest of the path. Okay. And why that's the case is from Kirchhoff's current law. We have two resistances in parallel. What happens is the current's going to divide between these two resistances. And this is precisely why the ground cord is protective from leakage currents. If you have an intact ground, it doesn't matter what the leakage current is, because virtually all of it is going to flow because of Kirchhoff's current law harmlessly to ground if it's intact. Very, very little. If we have 500 microamps here, half an ohm of resistance, a thousand ohm, worst case resistance, patient, 499 is going through the ground wire. So you have Intact ground wire, you don't have to worry about it. Uh, and one way to achieve this, especially in labs, I used to do is use a redundant ground. Just get another ground wire connected to the right, especially if it's semi permanent, and that's going to basically eliminate things also. Next thing you have to have reasonably low impedance contact between the case, okay, whether it be to the patient or the staff, the user. And then lastly, that user has to be a reasonably low connection to the physical curve in order to have a complete pathway for that leakage current to flow. All five of those things have to be present. There was some work done on actual cadavers that showed that even if you had a hand to foot current passing through the body, only about 10% of it actually went through the heart. So uh, still not a good thing to have, but there's still there's some protection that you would still have there. So all five of those things have to happen. So if you think of your logic gates, five input and gate, every one of these things have to be present before we're anybody going to get shocked. And these are independent events. And statistically, what this tells us is that these, these probabilities of something happened, probability just a number of chance goes from zero, totally impossible to happen. So one where absolutely it's going to happen. Anything in between is a number less than one greater than zero. And what happens when we have these independent events, like, like flipping a coin, okay? The second flip has, has no effect on what the outcome of the first flip is. So if we flip one coin, we got about a 50-50 chance of getting a heads. We flip it twice. The chance of getting two heads in a row is about 0.25. You flip it three times, the chance of getting three heads in a row, these, these probabilities multiple. And when we multiply little numbers, they get smaller. So we're down now 
to point one. So these are all independent events, these five electrical things that have to happen, independent events. And any one of these that gets reduced to zero, the whole probability goes to zero. So if you eliminate any one of those five things from happening, the chance of anybody getting shot is zero. It's not there. And um, that's, that's the key because there is so little opportunity, uh, especially now, of uh, having those things happen. And it's just not, not there. So the bottom line, uh, clearly, we want to continue to, to, to check the AC line cord, plug caps, strain release, because you see the damage. I mean, these things get ground up all the time. Clearly, 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 that is part of the safety inspection. That visual piece, that's a crucial thing. You don't want to mess with that. That, because that, our stuff gets beat up regularly. Uh, verifying the ground resistance, still a very legitimate thing to do. Because uh, the ground is more important, actually, than the leakage cards. The ground is intact, you know, here with the leakage cards. Uh, outlet tension, again, rather than just giving it up to facilities, it's, it's such a stink and simple thing to do that uh, sometimes you can tell when the outlet is sloppy, you can physically feel it. Uh, even in your homes, if you've ever felt a warm plug cap, uh, you know, from an uh, oven or a, a toaster or something, if it's warm, good chance the screws in there are loose. You've got a lot of resistance between the socket and the conductors. I squared R is power. That's why that plug can get, get warm. And then other than the incoming inspection, that there's some major stuff because uh, the codes don't require us to do this anymore other than in the beginning, which is not a bad thing. When the first things come in, you do some major work. But other than that, one less thing you got to worry about. Okay. And then lastly, yeah, it's blasphemy, but not all snatch. And somewhere, this is one of your responsibilities, effectively, as the technical resource and the experts in the facility. Is that when we know better, like Oprah Winfrey used to say, when you know better, you do better. So once we learn that we don't have to do this crap, you know, we, we should just take a stand and run the risk and uh, hopefully you don't get chewed up too much. Make some sense? Okay. Well, that's about all I have then. Unless you got any, any questions or issues on 